And that's for two reasons. One is that we actually understand the future of the universe better now than we used to. Not only was the universe expanding in traditional Einstein cosmology, but we didn't know what would happen in the future. Maybe it would expand forever, but maybe it would recollapse. Maybe the evolution of space-time would stop expanding. The gravitational force of galaxies would pull them together. And then you would have a big crunch in the future, which was kind of nice. It was a pleasing symmetry. Einstein himself liked this idea because the entire history of the universe would be in finite duration. It came into existence, it went out a few billion years, and that was all she wrote. These days, we are increasingly skeptical that that is the future of our actual universe. And the reason why is because we've looked at the universe once again, and we've seen that not only is it expanding, but it's accelerating. The galaxies that we see in the universe show no signs of slowing down and coming back together. They are moving apart faster and faster. And we have models to explain this involving dark energy, but we, even though the models are not firm, they tend to make you think that what will happen in the universe is that it will expand forever and ever. The future of the universe is an increasing story of dilution and cooling off and getting emptier and lonelier and slowing down, leaving you with empty space. If that is true, and it's by no means established, but at least seems very plausible, if not likely, then you have this weird asymmetry between the end of the universe, which goes on forever, and then the beginning. Why was there a beginning at some point if the future goes on forever? So that's one question. The other is, this story that we told you that convinced you there was a Big Bang is not internally consistent. We have theorems within Einstein's general theory of relativity, within our understanding of classical gravity, that given the conditions of the universe now, there must have been a singular point, a point where the universe was infinitely dense and infin had infinite space-time curvature. And we can even tell you when it was. It was about 14 billion years ago. And we even have data that tell you what it looked like one second after the Big Bang. However, these theoretical demonstrations using classical general relativity can't be right because this infinite point of singularity means that general relativity is not correct at that point in the universe's history. And nobody thinks that it is correct. What actually has to happen is that some better theory has to come into play before you hit this singular state. Normally, we think it's some quantum theory of gravity that we haven't yet developed. But the point is, all of our firm declarations that there wasn't anything before the Big Bang are based on a theory that doesn't apply at the Big Bang. So let's think hard about what could be right. We don't know yet the answer, but if you imagine trying to understand how quantum mechanics would change our notion of the early universe, it is more plausible than not that there was something before the Big Bang, that there was some pre-existing space and time from which the Big Bang evolved. The Big Bang was an event in the history of the universe not the beginning of it. And I can tell you specific scenarios. I have my own. It's, you know, you're not really a fully trained cosmologist unless you have your theory of either where the universe came from or where it's going. And I think that the best way to look at it is probably there was a pre-existing parent universe, and we are an offspring. We are a baby universe from that pre-existing parent. The pre-existing universe was perfectly empty but because of the influence of vacuum energy, which we now think we've uh, detected the influence of, there's tiny quantum fluctuations, which means that even empty space is not perfectly stable. Even a universe with nothing in it can have a little very unlikely but inevitable in an eternal universe event that gives rise to a whole new universe. And I would even argue, if I had much more time, that this is an explanatory theory because it explains features of our post-Big Bang universe that are extremely hard to account for otherwise, such as the arrow of time and other things that we observe about it. But I won't go there right now. Instead, I want to make a huge leap far beyond what I've just given you evidence to believe in and draw a moral from this story of the fact that the universe may very well be eternal. And the moral is don't bet against the enlightenment. Don't bet against the power of totalitarian, reductionistic scientific reasoning to explain things that might seem inexplicable at first blush. If you thought the universe came into existence, you might be tempted to conclude we need to explain the features of the universe by appealing to some agency outside the universe itself. Then you wait around, and your cosmologist friends come along and say, actually, the universe didn't come into existence. It's been around forever. You don't need to explain that particular feature of it. 
I would like to claim that things like that, episodes where a problem seems really hard, and yet a few years later you realize, oh, I have an idea that actually makes sense of that, are happening all the time and are characteristic of several things we've already been talking about today. The problem of the origin of the universe is a really trivial and simple and easy problem compared to the problem of the evolution of the entire biosphere or the origin of morality or the nature of romantic love. But I would argue that all of these, since I'm one of the two people who Stuart kept uh, referring to, that all of these are things that could, in principle, although obviously not in practice, be understood as the working out of the laws of physics. Nobody, there's, there's two possible arguments we could have here. One is, should you think of all these phenomena usefully as the working out of the standard model of particle physics or superstring theory or something like that? And there's nobody in the world who thinks the answer is yes. So that's not an interesting argument to have. The only interesting argument is, could you think about everything that happens in the universe as simply materialistic particles obeying their equations of motion? And I strongly think that the answer is yes. I've seen no evidence whatsoever in anything that Stuart said or anyone else to convince me otherwise. I think what happens is we look at problems that seem really, really difficult and we lose our nerve. We tend to blur the distinction between the infinite and the merely really big. The distinction between the impossible and the kind of difficult. Or the distinction between uh, things that we see all around us happening all the time and things that are actually necessary and could not be otherwise. When we see that many people around think that child slavery is bad, we begin to think that there's some intrinsic thing that needs a transcendental explanation for the fact that we have a universal morality that doesn't believe that we should enslave children. Then again, we have to admit that there were actually people out there who were enslaving children. So it's not as, as universal as it could be. It also seems, I would admit, if you don't look at it in the right way, it can seem impoverishing to claim that things like beauty and morality and ethics could be understood as the workings out of the laws of nature according to the equations of motion that they obey. But I don't think that that's right either. I think that it is no more, it, it no more reduces the understanding of human morality to say that it's consistent with saying that nothing ever happens in the universe that can't be expressed as a working out of the laws of physics, then, I doubt this sentence is going to make grammatical sense, but then it reduces the beauty of a rainbow to understand the electromagnetic spectrum. They're just different. It might be very, very useful in certain circumstances to talk about morality and right and wrong, and the fact that that is useful and the fact that that's the way we should be thinking about it is in no way incompatible with the fact that we could all in a complete description, think of ourselves as particles obeying the standard model of particle physics. So because we're faced with these problems that are hard, but nevertheless, we see specific examples of hard problems that get solutions, I would say that we should look at the problems of where does love come from, where does morality come from, how does the biosphere evolve, and say, these are hard problems, let's get to work. Thank you.